Hello everyone, welcome to Let's Learn Physics, the show where I explain graduate level physics textbooks to curious minds like you. Today, we'll be continuing our series on classical mechanics by Goldstein and collaborators with rigid body equations of motion. Last time we learned that rigid body motion is translation and rotation of rigid objects. We learned how to represent this motion with coordinates using the Euler angles and rotational velocity. Today we will be taking that to the next step and finding equations and concepts for rigid objects in rotation. We'll be looking at the principal moments of inertia, the inertia ellipsoid, the heavy symmetric top, the precession of astronomical objects, and the precession of charges in a magnetic field. We begin with section 5.1 angular momentum of motion about a point. Remember from last time, rigid body motion is translation plus rotation. These are mathematically separable because we can choose a coordinate system that moves with the object. So for this chapter, we'll focus on the rotation. A rotating object or an orbiting object has angular momentum. This is a vector that depends on the mass of the object, how far it is from the axis of rotation, and how fast it's moving. If we add it up for all of the particles making up the rigid body, we get the total angular momentum. So let's write out one term of that cross product. It's got three terms, and those are all stuff multiplied by components of the angular velocity. So we can simplify this by writing that extra stuff as Ixx, Ixy, and Ixz. And the y and z equations for angular momentum are going to look the same, but cycled. Does it ring any bells? These i's look like the components of a matrix operator. And we can rewrite the angular momentum equation like this. When i operates on the angular velocity, we get angular momentum. i is called the moment of inertia, and it is to rotational motion what mass is to linear motion. The higher the mass, the greater the force needed to start or stop an object moving. The higher the moment of inertia, the greater the torque needed to start or stop an object rotating. That's the end of 5.1. 5.2 talks about a new math term, which is very important for physics, called tensors. You've heard of a scalar, which is just a number. You've heard of a vector, which is a row of numbers. And you've heard of a matrix, which is a rectangle of numbers. Well, what if I told you that mathematicians have extended this to an arbitrary number of dimensions, and they call this idea a tensor? It's a little more complicated than that. Tensors have restrictions that matrices and higher dimensional objects don't have. For instance, tensors have to be square, or cubic, or you know, hypercubic. They have to be the same size in every dimension. Tensors modify other objects in physics. Every tensor is an operator. And tensors have to transform orthogonally. That is, when you transform them, they don't scale or skew. If you orthogonally transform a vector, you can also orthogonally transform a tensor modified vector. If matrix A is an orthogonal transformation to a different basis, then we can transform tensor T into the new basis using this equation. Basically, the important thing to remember is that a scalar is a zero tensor, a vector is a one tensor, a matrix is a two tensor, and it continues. Tensors can have arbitrary dimensions. Section 5.3 is the inertia tensor and moment of inertia. The section derives the magnitude of I for a point mass orbiting an axis. The result is what you learn in college physics, the mass times the distance squared. I adds linearly for multiple particles, so if you want to calculate it for a solid object, you can do it using an integral. The moment of inertia depends on the axis. If we change the axis, we change the moment of inertia. If we know the moment of inertia through one axis, we can calculate it through a parallel axis using the parallel axis theorem. It's equal to the moment of inertia through the original axis plus the mass times the distance between the previous axis and the new axis squared. Section 5.4 is called the principal axis transformation. This section is a little mathy, but it's really interesting. You know how I is a matrix? Well, every moment of inertia can be transformed to be a diagonal matrix. That is, it has three components, I1, I2, and I3 along the diagonal. These are called the principal moments of inertia, 
and there are around three orthogonal axes attached to the object called the principal axes. For instance, this TV remote, the principal axes would be longwise, crosswise, and up and down. If you have the general inertia tensor, you can find the principal moments by finding the eigenvalues. If that's something you want to learn how to do, there's plenty of resources to figure it out. We won't go into that here. Because there are three principal axes, the moment of inertia is the same as for an ellipsoid, which means when doing rotational calculations, rigid objects can be treated as ellipsoids. The principal axes don't need to pass through the center of mass of the object. Every point inside and outside of a rigid body has its own three principal axes. And we choose the principal axes based on what point is fixed in the rotation. For the Earth revolving around the Sun, for example, the fixed point is not in the Earth, it's in the Sun. Section 5.5, Euler's Equations of Motion for Rigid Bodies. In chapter one, we talked about generalized coordinates and the Lagrangian method. We used Euler's equations to find the equations of motion, and in rigid body motion, the coordinates are x, y, z, and the Euler angles. The kinetic energy can be represented as translational energy plus rotational energy. If we can also separate the potential energy, that means we can choose coordinates that move with the fixed point of the object, so that the only coordinates we have to care about are the rotational coordinates. The chapter says these equations are really hard to solve, and so instead it uses what it calls the Newtonian method, which says the change in angular momentum over time is equal to a torque. Because the angular momentum is given by the moment of inertia times the angular velocity, and the change in angular momentum over time in the rest frame can be transformed into the body frame using this equation from chapter four, we get three equations that look like this with the indices cycled as the equations of motion for rotation. Section 5.6 is about torque-free motion of a rigid body. Looking at the equation we just brought up with the torque equal to zero, we have three equations that look like this. These are the equations of motion for rotation about a fixed point. If no point is artificially fixed, then that fixed point is the center of mass. The chapter then does a somewhat fun discussion of the rotation of an ellipsoid given by a vector labeled rho, which can point in any direction, and the imaginary surface where its tip lands is called the inertia ellipsoid. If rho points along the axis of rotation, the angular momentum points in the direction normal to the ellipsoid where rho touches it. Maybe counterintuitively, this means the angular momentum and the angular velocity can point in different directions. For torque-free rotation, the angular momentum is constant, but the angular velocity may not be. If we imagine a plane perpendicular to the inertia ellipsoid, where the angular momentum points straight down through, then as the object tumbles, its inertia ellipsoid rolls without slipping on this flat plane the vector rho always touching both the ellipsoid and the plane at the point where they contact. The path vector rho traces on the ellipsoid is called the pole hode, and the path vector rho traces on the plane is called the herpel hode. And no, I am not making this up. The section wraps up by talking about a different ellipsoid, the angular momentum ellipsoid, and shows that the rotation is steady, that is, it doesn't wobble or tumble, only around the principal axes. Furthermore, the rotation is only stable around the minimum principal axis and the maximum principal axis. If we look at this TV remote, the minimum principal axis rotates this way, rotates this way. The maximum principal axis rotates this way. But the intermediate principal axis, this one, kind of wobbles. It's really hard to get it to, to spin without stumbling if, if you do it this way. If the object is symmetrical around a principal axis, the equations of motion simplify to this. If you take in differential equations, this may look familiar, having the usual solutions of cosine omega t and sine omega t. This means as the object spins, its angular velocity processes in a circle 
around the vector of angular momentum. Section 5.7 is all about the heavy symmetric top with one point fixed. It talks about tops like the child's toy, the, the spinny top. We can analyze it using the three Euler angles. Psi dot represents its rotation around its own symmetry axis. Phi dot represents its rotation around the vertical axis. And theta dot represents its bobbing or nutation toward and away from the vertical axis. This chapter sets up the Lagrangian and solves the equations of motion, which is a very long process that involves lots of substitutions, which is not a subject for this video. The result is, as the top spins, it bobs up and down and processes around the vertical axis. It shows this picture of the paths the axis of symmetry of the top can trace out. If the kinetic energy is much, much greater than the potential energy, that is, it's spinning very, very fast, it is called a fast top. A number of approximations can be made for fast tops. Again, there's a lot of math that goes into solving it, but the results are fast tops bob smaller, fast tops bob faster, and fast tops process slower. They can also be approximated to stay completely vertical or have the same angle and process in a neat circle. In real life, friction slows tops down, causing their motion to be really hard to calculate. Sometimes friction can do really interesting things, like causing a tippy top to turn upside down and stand up on its stem. The section wraps up by talking about gyroscopes, which are basically tops where the fixed point is the center of mass. By affixing it in such a way that it can rotate in whatever direction inside its casing, a gyroscope will maintain its orientation and so can be used as an orientation sensor, for instance, in an airplane or a helicopter. If there's a torque on the gyroscope, it begins to process, which is something else that can be detected. Section 5.8 talks about the precession of the equinoxes and satellite orbits. The planet Earth's rotation is not constant, but it processes very slowly. This is because it's not totally spherical, but slightly oblate. This makes the sun exert torque on the Earth in the winter and the summer, and so does the moon when it's in similar positions. The chapter goes into some math and ends up with this equation, which, when we plug in the numbers, we find that summer and winter trade places in the Earth's orbit every 18,000 years. Because of the Earth's shape, it also exerts torque on circular orbits around it. Deriving this equation and putting in the numbers for near-Earth satellites, the chapter calculates that satellite orbits process fully in about six weeks. This means satellites don't just stay in their circular orbits, they kind of go all over the place. Section 5.9 closes off with the precession of charges in a magnetic field. Atoms and other particles have a magnetic moment related to their angular momentum by this equation. Gamma is typically given by this relation and is called the gyromagnetic ratio. Through some algebra, we find an equation for the precession of a rotating charge in a magnetic field. This is called the Larmor frequency. And that's it for chapter five. We talked all about rotational motion with the moment of inertia tensor, the principal axes of rotation, and the precession of objects like tops and the Earth under a torque. Next time, we'll talk about oscillations. Thanks so much for watching. Let me know what you thought in the comments. Don't forget to like, and subscribe and hit the bell if you'd like to be notified when more videos like this come out. If you think this type of analysis is valuable, you can support me on Patreon like these cool people. That's it for today. I'll see you next time.